Thank you so much for giving me the privilege to come to Britain um, to give a talk on enterovirus infection, chronic fatigue syndrome, myalgic uh, encephalomyelitis. Actually, I have to say that most of the, some of the best work originated in this country. Unfortunately, we Americans did not follow through on these studies, and now we're catching up. Hopefully, this talk will be useful. I'm going to present you a case. As a clinician researcher, I think it's important to understand the clinical manifestation of an illness. While we talk about the criteria, you know, we've gone through the criteria for chronic fatigue syndrome, sometimes we fail to recognize the very first manifestation of the illness. This case is, it was a 19-year-old white female, developed a severe respiratory infection while living in a college dormitory in Wisconsin, United States. She was treated with azithromycin, or known as Zithromax, and the symptoms did not improve immediately, but gradually improved after about a month. Practically everyone in the dormitory was sick, and this disease lasted a lot longer than two, three weeks, so we knew it was not influenza. Influenza rarely ever lasts a week, okay? So this was not influenza. Then a few months later, in May of 2005, she developed right lower quadrant pain, low-grade fevers, nice sweats, and significant fatigue that she actually had to quit college. She came home to Los Angeles, and eventually she was in an HMO system, kind of like your uh, health care. Eventually she went to see a gastroenterologist. A CAT scan of the abdomen showed a circumferential, that means all around, thickening of the terminal ilium. And terminal ilium is the end of the small bowel, right before the colon starts. And a colonoscopy showed a small nodular lesions in the terminal ilium, but the colon itself looked very normal. Biopsy the nodules demonstrate a lymphoid hyperplasia. That means that there are a lot of lymphoid tissue, lymphocytes in the area, but there was no evidence of lymphoma. But there was no evidence of granuloma suggestive of Crohn's disease by histology. A week bi post biopsy, obviously this procedure stirred up a problem. She was admitted to the hospital with severe weakness, fatigue, fevers 102 uh, Fahrenheit, I'd rather, nice sweats, debilitating myalgia, vomiting, diarrhea, headaches, and marked leukopenia. The white blood count was only about 2,000, and her absolute neutrophil count was as low as 350, almost about 2,000 or higher. Physical examination showed throat erythema. She had cervical lymphadenopathy. She was tachycardic. She had epicastric, that means the, uh, the middle upper part of the stomach, and right lower quadrant tenderness. She had diffuse muscle tenderness and muscle weakness. This is the picture seen by colonoscopy. Here is the end of the terminal ilium. And you can, normal mucosa looks more like this on the top here. That's normal. Here you can see all these small nodules. This is where in this area. You can see a couple of here. See these little nodules? Okay. And you can see some small amount of bleeding underneath the lining of the intestines, okay? We obtained a, 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 a thin sections of this biopsy, and we were able to amplify enterovirus RNA sequence from this. So the, pres the virus was present here. Then later on, we did a different type of test with the help of another uh, 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 molecular biologist who did a real-time reverse transcriptase PCR assay using a different system that this showed approximately 100,000 viruses or copies of enterovirus RNA in a 40 micron thick section. 40 micron is about four one hundredth of a millimeter, okay, of this two by three millimeter biopsies. So how many viruses do you think she had in the intestines? Millions. In the body? Millions. We did a bone marrow biopsy that showed normal cellular elements. The reason we did this is we were afraid that she may have leukemia. We also detected the enterovirus RNA in the bone marrow biopsy. The IgG, IgM antibodies for adenovirus, human herpes 6 virus, CMV were negative. Epstein-Barr virus, IgG, was positive with a negative IgM. So we knew this was not acute Epstein-Barr, CMV, or HHV6, or adenovirus infection. Interesting enough, Coxsackie B virus 1 through 6 and Echovirus 6, 9, 6, 7, 9, 11, 30 antibodies were negative. I will come to this in a second. There are many more enteroviruses than we can detect by the neutralizing antibody test. 
So she was given two doses of intravenous immunoglobulin. As Dr. Hooper just pointed out, IVIG does work for some of these virus infections. So we gave her this, and she had a gradual improvement of her symptoms and fevers over the next seven days. And the leukopenia improved. She was discharged in a week. After the hospitalization, she still had continued fever, myalgia, headaches, lower abdominal pain, function, the symptoms of functional dyspepsia or irritable bowel syndrome, but was able to function about three to four hours a day. She tried to go back to school or go back to work, but she was not able to. This lasted about the next, next, next four months. Then after this, she lapsed into a severe state of chronic fatigue syndrome, and she could not even get out of bed for more than one to two hours a day. About a year and a half after this hospitalization, we asked her if she would like to have a stomach biopsy to document the presence of the virus in her stomach, and she agreed to. And in this picture here, which is with 100x magnification, we can see this diffuse brown staining. The brown color indicates the presence of the viral protein. The blue is the background. So normal cells are blue. There are some inflammatory cells here. And in this 400x magnification, you can see the viral protein is concentrated in these cells, which are larger than the smaller cells here. The smaller cells are chief cells, and the larger cells are parietal cells. Parietal cells is the most metabolically active cell in the stomach. The job is to produce acid, so it is metabolically active. We also detected enteroviral RNA sequence in the stomach biopsies. So this is almost about two years after the respiratory infection and a year and a half after the, gast the gastrointestinal manifestation. Enteroviruses are termed picornavirus, small RNA virus. And the genome is a positive strand RNA, not unlike the herpes virus Dr. Lerner talked about, the genome is deep made of DNA. You will see this, the term VP1, VP2. These are viral capsid protein 1 through 4. These makes up the, the capsid protein that basically will, serve, will basically coat the, the genome inside, and that will become a virus like this. Polioviruses, there are three, and there, these are the, the best worked out enteroviruses of the whole uh, uh, um, genus. Then you have Coxsackie A virus, there are 23. Coxsackie B, there's only six. Echoviruses, there are 26. As you notice that in the previous slide, we were only able to test five out of these 26. And now any of the new enteroviruses that are found are given a number. Uh, so 60A, 71, and now I think they're up to the 90s now. It's important to go over the symptoms, the root of transmission of acute enterovirus infection. I'm sure a number of patients will recall the flu-like illness you had in the very beginning. In order to understand chronic infection, you must appreciate what the acute infection is like. I'll give you an example. A patient comes to my office and said, doctor, I had the flu. I said, oh, you had the flu. I was thinking the patient had influenza, especially this is in December of the year. And I said, you had high fevers, you had respiratory symptoms, you were coughing, you had a sore throat. No, doctor, that's not what I meant. I had vomiting and diarrhea. But that's not influenza, is it? With this type of, this is a limited way, but it actually works out fairly well to recognize or narrow down the viruses that may be causing the acute infection. Acute enterovirus infections are very, very common. In the United States alone, there are more than 50 million cases per year. This was estimated probably more than 10 years ago. So one in four to one in five Americans can get sick with an infection like this per year. Largely, the infection could be asymptomatic. That is, the patient may have a very little symptoms or no symptoms at all and just shed the virus. But the majority of the patients do have respiratory or GI or respiratory and GI symptoms. These are the two rules of entry, respiratory treat, it will enter through either the nose or the throat, so a patient will have rhinitis, like runny nose, sinus congestions, sore throats, bronchitis, pleural involvement, like pleurisy, and even pneumonia. Gastrointestinal manifestations, the most common, of course, is the vomiting. If you ingest the virus, the first station to hit is the stomach. So that, this can occur within a very short time after ingestion. It could be several hours to several days. The incubation period is usually about three days to three weeks. Patient can have diarrhea, gastritis. Some patients, when they are sick, could not even tolerate one ounce of water. 
They couldn't eat. They would be like this for several months. Terminal ileitis is like what we just saw in the first patient I presented. Colitis, inflammation of the colon. Hepatitis, liver inflammation. And pancreatitis. Sometimes a number of these things can go together. Some patients can have a prolonged fever episode lasting to three to four weeks. And temperature can be as high as 102 to 104, again, Fahrenheit. That's pretty burning hot. If it's a centigrade, we'd be all dead. We would have a temperature that high. So very commonly, patient can present with leukopenia. And we see this quite often. And bone marrow failure in some younger patients. And it's certainly more severe in the immunocompromised patients. How I started thinking about antivirus actually were actually, I, it helped me in a patient who was a, had a renal transplant. And she came in with diarrhea and headaches and fevers. She eventually died of this infection. And we grew the virus out of the spinal fluid and also in the fecal material. I really was, then I realized this type of virus can be very deadly. And when I told the other physicians about this, finding the enoviruses in these areas, and the, then the response was, well, all you think about is enterovirus. Okay, all right. Amazing, isn't it? Okay, these viruses, after they replicate in the initial areas of infection, they can disseminate to the central nervous system cardiovascular system, the muscles. Very few viruses can infect the brain, the heart, and the muscle together. As far as I know, there's only one class of virus that can do all three, okay? So meningitis, encephalitis, myelitis, epidemic vertigos, I'm sure a number of patients present with this horrible vertigo, and sometimes you can develop bilateral deafness with this type of infection. Cardiovascular infections, <laughs> Myopericarditis, involvement of the myocardium, and also the envelope around the, the heart. Endocarditis can happen. Muscle infections usually can present with acute myositis. That's actually true inflammation of the muscles, will break down the muscles. Rhabdomyolysis, which can be seen with a number of infections, and joint pains, and arth true arthritis, and also pleurodynia, which is Borholm's disease, as many of you already know. Skin manifestations are quite common. Patient can have little clear fluid bu bubble-like uh, uh, lesions of a secular, very much like chickenpox, macular papular, a little bumps, a uh, little red raised bumps, uh, petechiae is a little like blood underneath the skin, urticaria, which are also like hives. Very often, patients present with urticaria are thought to have allergies. In the ER, the emergency room physicians will treat these patients with steroids and then the patient would develop chronic fatigue syndrome afterwards. Vasculitis, which is inflammation of the blood vessels, erythema multiforme, and Stephen Johnson's are much more severe uh, skin and mucous membrane involvements. And anthems, which I will show you in a while, herpangina, as you know, are, are lesions of the heart palate, which is only exclusively seen with enteroviruses. And we can also see tongue and oral ulcerations. What determines the outcome of an acute infection is what we call the T-cell response. And you, I'm sure you've been hearing a lot about Th1, Th2. Th1 response, if you can see here, normally when we're asymptomatic, you're at a horizontal line. When you see a virus, logical, usually the, T, the Th1 will dominate, okay? And what Th1 is here, Th2 is here. And then you will pour out these inflammatory cytokines. Some are pro-inflammatory, some are T-cell cytokines. And this will eventually lead to the eradication of the infection. Then the Th2 side will secrete the regulatory cytokines and then tell the Th1 to shut off. Then you will go back to the horizontal line. The infection, the symptoms will resolve. That's the case we see with influenza. Influenza never lasts the body. Even in the bone marrow transplant patients, we, we can see the virus survive for about a month, but usually by, the, by that time, hopefully the physician will figure it out and treat the patient with antiviral drugs. But normally it does not last that long. But if you mount a TH2 response, okay, if patients already had a history of severe allergic rhinitis, asthma, eczema, use of steroids predisposed to a TH2 dominant response, vigorous exercise, marathon runners, prior closely spaced infections, and also pregnancy, there's a TH2 dominant response, and also the last two weeks of the, of the menstrual period. 
is also Th2 dominant. Then the response is like this. You secrete all the regulatory cytokines. These will mount an inflammatory response against the viruses, but not able to eradicate it. And this will result in persistence of infection. But it takes two to tangle. It takes the immune system, and it must take a virus that's capable of surviving in your body to have this. A cold virus doesn't survive in your body for very long. Even if you mount a wrong response, you will get rid of the virus eventually. But enteroviruses are a little bit smarter. We often see these ulcerations on the tongue in patients who come in with acute enterovirus infections, like patients with viral meningitis after they traveled to Mexico and they had a great lobster dinner. And four or five days later, they come in with horrible headaches, sometimes with encephalitis, and they have extensive ulcerations of their tongue. Interesting enough, number of these patients, year, months to years later, we could find the viral gene, enterovirus gene in the blood. They still have the ulceration. It seems to correlate. This is a patient, actually eventually developed HIV infection, but he already had chronic fatigue syndrome for 25 years before he developed HIV. And he was telling me that whenever he got sick, he would see all these lesions on the heart palate here. This is initially, they were much more impressive than this, and this is one of the occasions I actually had a, my camera with me and I took a picture. So this is like herpangina, and this is exclusively seen with enteroviruses. The work on polio has shed a lot of light on how these viruses grow in cells. In the acute infection, if you look on the right-hand side of this diagram, okay, the viral RNA, the, the, the template, is this brown color genome, and is made into a plus genome. This is called the genomic RNA. This is then is translated into proteins, and if, there, if the, the condition is just right, you make a lot of these caps of proteins, you can see they will cover the genomic, the genome will go inside this little capsid and you'll form a virus, a virion. This I've certainly seen with acute infection, a large number of these viruses are produced. But our body isn't so dumb either. We put up a fight. We produce interferon. We have, you know, interleukins that are produced trying to control this infection. Then let's look at the left hand side. With all the interferons produced and the cytokine produced, the protein synthesis is much decreased. So we have actually less of the caps of protein. And in this case, if you look at the, the RNA here, you started making positive strand RNA, and also you see here is making the positive, R, positive strand RNA, then more of the negative strand RNA is produced. This actually, I will show you later, eventually could form what we call a double-stranded RNA and survive in this so-called membrane vesicle. Membrane vesicle is a little outpouching pocket inside the cell. And um, this is where poliovirus will grow in these membrane vesicles. Some of the proteins are, made, are eventually made, as you can see here. But in this setting, there's so little of the caps of protein, really there isn't enough to make a virus. So the virus will persist in this fashion. We'll come to back to that in a second. This is an experiment Dr. Tam and Masner did at University of Minnesota. These are rheumatologists very interested in muscle diseases. They are more interested in autoimmune manifestation of uh, muscle disease. But then they found that Coxsackie B virus seems to be a trigger of this disease. So what they were doing was they were giving mice this Coxsackie B virus by an injection into the belly. And they poke a hole into the, the hind leg of the, uh, the mice Within a few days, the virus will enter the injured leg and start producing this, this mild muscle infection. What they notice is that, in, please follow me with on the right-hand side, this first panel here. In the, by day seven, when the acute infection is well established, you see a large amount of this positive strand RNA. Remember the one I saw you show you on the previous slide? There's a large amount of this genomic RNA made, and like there's a lot of viruses are made, when he, she used an enzyme to try to break down this RNA, this is a single-strand RNA, then you got a left of it with very, very little of it on the right-hand side of this big, bright band. Then if she took the muscle samples a month later or even later. You see very little of this positive-strand RNA, at least before the digestion. And after the digestion, it's exactly the same. 
What she then went on to do is study these strands by strand-specific primers. And basically, she came out with essentially no mutation in the viral genome that this here actually is in the form of a double-stranded RNA. Our body cannot degrade double-stranded RNA. We don't have a mechanism to degrade a large amount of it. So then the next finding from Dr. Kim and also Dr. Nora Chapman from the University of uh, Nebraska, they work in viral myocarditis. And they have always been interested in chronic myocarditis because they have previously shown that the viral genome can survive in the heart for up to one or two years uh, after the mice are infected. Well, mice only live two years. So that's practically the entire lifetime of the mice. They went on to study and actually, they were successful in growing the virus from the murine heart, okay? Few months to one year later. What they found out is that these viruses now have mutated. So you, once you put into a tissue culture, you have to be very, very patient. The virus does not kill the cell, does not produce a massive amount of virus in a few days. You have to wait practically six weeks before you can start harvesting the cells and start looking for the virus. And there was absolutely no killing of, of the, the cells by the, by the mutated virus. What they found was there was a deletion in the five prime non-translated end. This is the beginning of the virus genome. There's a certain section of it, it just deleted. When this is deleted, this allowed the virus to grow very slowly inside the cell and not kill the cell, which protects it, okay? So that's what they concluded. I'm now going to review some of the past evidence for chronic, uh, for the persistence, for enterovirus persistence in chronic fatigue syndrome, my, uh, myalgic encephalomyelitis. You can, you're going to see that most of the data came from this country. Niren initially found the PCR assay looking for viral RNA was a better test than the neutralizing antibody for differentiating the CFS patients from controls. And then Go, uh, I believe that he was also in Scotland, found enteroviral RNA sequence in the muscle biopsy specimens from 53% of the patients, chronic fatigue syndrome, ME, and 19% of the controls. A subsequent studies he did, actually published in the uh, Clinical Infectious Disease Journal in 1994, used a different set of controls. This, these controls were patients with muscular dystrophy, underlying muscle disease. Of course, they don't walk, they don't move very much, okay? And then the, the, the percent of the positive RNA in the CFS patients was comparable to the patients with muscular dystrophy. So from that point on, the, this was kind of not looked at very much. The Dr. Yosef reported CDV, uh, Kawasaki B virus RNA persistence in the muscle fibers in six out of 13, or 46 percent of adult patients with dermatomyositis. This is, a, is a, thought to be an autoimmune uh, muscle disease or polymyositis using in situ hybridization. His greatest contribution also is to find the monoclonal antibody that was stained for enterovirus, which I'll show you later. Cunningham later demonstrated that the enterovirus RNA found in the patient material had a positive to a negative strand ratio of one to one. Remember the chronic infection model of polyvirus is one to one, rather than the 100 to one ratio found in control enterovirus cultures. This control enterovirus culture is more indicative of an acute enterovirus infection. Then the American investigators, unfortunately, uh, initially led by the NIH, um, the, the investigator actually was one of my teachers when I was an infectious disease fellow at the Bethesda Naval Hospital. He sent blood to the CDC and also to Dr. Robart in Denver, uh, Denver Children's Hospital. We have no idea how long these blood were sitting around, how the blood were handled, but basically we Americans did not reproduce this type of results. So eventually at the end, in 1994, when this summit happened, they basically felt, well, the results were not reproducible, okay, no, vir no viruses were found in these patients. This has led an entire shift in the paradigm of this illness. Later on, in 2000, actually from Germany and France, this is France and Germany, I believe, they also found enterovirus RNA in the muscle biopsies of 20% of the fibromyalgia patients as compared to zero of the controls. 
And Lang then found that the RNA in the muscle biopsies of chronic fatigue patients and correlated with the rapid accumulation of lactate with subthreshold exercise. Dr. Galbraith and Aaron and Clemens published this paper. I'm just not going to bore you with this detail, but just to show you that, they actually sequenced the viral RNA, actually it's the cDNA they found in the blood of chronic fatigue patients, and compared it with the sequence of Coxsackie B and polioviruses, et cetera, and found a very close similarity. And then the next one, which really just grabbed me when I read this paper, was the paper published by Dr. McGarry, uh, Go and Behan in the Annals of Internal Medicine in 1994. This was a patient, a 30-year-old patient with CFS ME for five years and attempted a suicide and died of complications. Before she was extubated and, and she, she had tissues removed from different parts of the brain, heart, skeletal muscles, lung, and spleen. And there were four control samples from patients who died of C, uh, a cerebrovascular accident and four patients who died from depression and suicide. Enterovirus RNA was found in the muscles, heart, hypothalamus, and brainstem. As demonstrated, see these here, right here. But the controls did not show it. And they also sequenced this partial se uh, sequencing of this gene, and this showed about 83% homology to the Coxsackie B3 gene. This was very good evidence that the virus could survive in various parts of the body. But an opportunity like this doesn't come often. This even one case show us the virus can persist. Our work started in about 1998. By serendipity, we, f we, we, f we figured out how to do the neutralizing antibodies for Coxsackie B1 through 6 and echoviruses. Actually, one of the patients with this chronic fatigue syndrome went to see the rheumatologist, and she had persistent symptoms. And I told the rheumatologist, I think a virus is driving this process and let's send her to the laboratory again to get the antibody test. Well, because she was so busy, she couldn't draw the blood in her office. She sent the patient to a, a lab three doors down, and that laboratory did the neutralizing antibody. For the first time in my 10 years, I found a positive test. The test we usually do is the complement fixation test is neither sensitive nor specific. That means if you have a positive test, it's worthless. If it's a negative test, it's worthless, so it's worthless. Okay. So we, so we first set out to look at what are the antibody titers for the controls. So we took 150 controls. These are the patients, these are the people that came with the patients. As you know how sick you are when you come to a doctor's office. Somebody have to drive you and, and all this. Your relative, husband, or, or another spouse will have to come with you. So we took their antibody test. This is Kawasaki B2345, Echo 6, 7, 9, 11, 30. You can see the open circles. This is about the tighter. This is, this is about 160 here. That's about the max. Sometimes you get to 320 and 640 for Coxsackie B4. These are the patients. They're much higher, right? Some patients are down here. So using this information and also the description of the initial infection, the initial laboratory test in the first three months, and also an appropriate response to an anti- biotic or antiviral drugs, we were able to categorize these patients as what virus etiology they had. Chlamydia pneumoniae is an intracellular bacteria, very much look like a virus, but it can, it, we can treat it with antibiotics. In our, my analysis of 200 patients, there were 18 patients with this. This was the first infection I found that's treatable. Then I realized everything after this is treatable. You just got to find out what it is first. Epstein-Barr virus with a positive uh, Epstein-Barr DNA in the blood, but responsive to valacyclovir, high-dose acyclovir IV, and there were only six of those. Cytomegalovirus, which responded to intra antiviral drugs with an initial positive IgM test, it was, those are three out of 200. Parvovirus B19, about three. Recurrent uh, varicella zoster, patient with shingles that just kept coming back. And they responded to, six of them responded to antiviral therapy. So they have presumed recurrent VZV as the cause of the chronic fatigue syndrome. Recurrent HHV6, as the patient had recurrent rashes. Every few months, she would develop this roseola-like rash, high fevers, about three days, followed by the rash. 
then she'll lapse into this chronic fatigue state. There was only one of those. There could, certainly could be other HHV6 patients that I actually included in the so-called unknown. Known causes of hepatitis uh, C, also B, I did not include. The patient improved after treatments with interferon and ribavirin. Neurocardiogenic hypotension, you heard earlier from Dr. Newton, there were actually two patients with this. Interestingly, one patient just got married, and three months later, she, she, got the, she developed this so-called viral, post-viral fatigue. And by the ninth month, she fulfilled all the criteria necessary for the diagnosis of CFS, ME. But I have to say, though, that that's why how the subsets are different. She did not have the debilitating muscle pain. She did not have much gastrointestinal illness. The only test I can come up with, come up with was a low-level CMV IgM and a very, very high level of CMV IgG. So I treated her with intravenous gencyclovir, just like Dr. Lerner did after I read his paper. Interesting enough, in two weeks, the patient's fever, lymph nodes, swirthrose all disappeared. But then she started falling down. She started having syncopes. We put her on a tell-table test. Her blood pressure dropped down to 40 systolic. So we put her on a medication called midodrin, which constricts the blood vessels. After titrating the dose and get her up to the maximum dose for two months, her symptoms totally resolved. So could a virus infection be associated with pathophysiologic changes that actually is worsened by the intravenous antiviral treatment? In this case, that looked fairly clear. But the patient did respond to drugs that will restore the, the physiologic abnormality. Toxic mold exposure, post-vaccinations, then we have a great big number here for chronic antivirus infection. Of course, for, at this point, I didn't have any treatment for it, so we couldn't really qualify them with that particular criteria. So more than half the patient probably had antivirus infection. Then the first collaboration we had on doing the viral RNA in the blood was with Dr. Joe and Dr. Liebling at, at UCLA. And we isolated the, the peripheral blood mononuclear cells from the patient with high titers of antibodies for Coxsackie B uh, and, uh, and also for echoviruses. This is this patient's B1. Then we extract the RNA, then we amplify it with a, with a nested PCR. We found a 290 base pair, see this band right here, then this was sequenced uh, out to be antivirus. We had, in our initial data, 50% 50 per, 50 of the 30 patients were positive. We then have confirmation from another laboratory who did different patients, and they were also able to find antivirus RNA in other patients. Then we started screening more patients with a more rapid method. So this was a RT-PCR EIA method, so whenever the patient's test is positive, it will turn yellow. These are about 100 copies of the standard. This is about 1,000 copies of the standard. This is a native control. This is one of the plates. You can see a number of the patients were positive. This is a slide that represented probably about four to five years of our work. My son did all this work. And um, initially what we did, we took the blood from chronic fatigue patients and about 200, 112 out of 236 patients, or 48 percent, and but only nine of the 118 controls, or 8 percent, were positive for enterovirus RNA in the blood. But this is using the blood cells rather than the plasma itself. Then, as we kept doing this work, we started saying we we need to reproduce this. We need to do more samples. So, of the patients, I had more than two samples. Okay, only 38 percent were positive and only 4% of the controls were positive. When the pa whether the patient had the illness more than five years or less than five years did not seem to make a difference. It was about 38%. Then from March 01 to August 08, we have drawn more than 2,500 blood samples from more than 600 patients, and about 35% of the patients were positive. But remember, this is more than one sample. We have to take several samples from each patient in order to get two positive. If we just do one sample on each patient, the yield probably was less than 5 to 10%. Okay. Bedridden patients seems to have more positive tests, 70% of the 20 patients that actually were positive. And then the patient that could work about four to eight hours a day, only about 12% of those patients were positive. One thing I want to point out is that, as with any type of research, you have to kind of know what your, how sensitive the test is. With this technique, we are able to detect down to 80 to 800 copies of the RNA per milliliter of blood. Anything less than that, we're going to see a lesser yield. That may have been the problem that we had 
in the, in the 80s and the early 90s. That's why the results were not reproducible, okay? A better laboratory could actually find this, and, a, and the laboratory not as familiar with it, without having a standard. It's very hard to compare apples and oranges, et cetera. On the right-hand table here, you can see just briefly, is that we want to just take serial bloods from the patients to see are they positive? If, if they are persistently positive, why do we have this disagreement between investigators? Like in HIV infection, you can get a blood sample by any laboratory, you'll find the RNA of the HIV. There's no doubt about that, right? In this illness, it's totally different. Some, most of the patients are positive in the beginning, okay? Then you can see with time, sometimes three months, you see a positive, six months, you don't see it, et cetera, et cetera. So this viral RNA is not consistently detected in the blood to allow us to figure out what the patient has. That was one of the problems. The other problem is the RNA preservation. This probably happened in the 80s, because I noticed in the British investigators' work that the blood would process very, very quickly. We use it within two to four hours of blood draw. This is why that if, if blood was sitting around for more than a few hours, this thing is gone. We have data to show this. You know, we, have, we, we, we take the blood sample, process at two hours, versus seven, eight hours later, you can find the RNA later, okay? So using the PAX gene tubes, which Dr. Kerr uses all the time, we can actually find the genes, you know, of, of uh, the viral RNA in about 27% of the patients. Using the yellow top as the acid citrate uh, dextrose A tubes, this is the one that I actually have to run to the laboratory between patients to centrifuge it and collect the serum and the plasma and then freeze it immediately. These actually came out to be fairly close, okay? Then the patients, eventually we did 226 blood samples. This is a one draw only, okay? 29% of the PAX gene tube were positive for the viral RNA, some confirmed by the sequencing. Later on, we also did the stomach biopsies with concomitant PAX gene draws. 38 patients have both of PAX gene and stomach biopsies, and 82% of the patients stained positive for viral protein in the stomach, and about 26% were positive for viral RNA in the blood. What gave me even more courage to pursue this enterovirus research is the treatment data. Because for many years, you can have all the fun in the laboratory, but the patient keep coming back, doctor, what are you gonna offer me? What are you gonna do for me, right? We talked to drug companies again and again. They are not interested in doing any studies. So we started trying different things. This is a, uh, a treatment studies um, using interferon alpha, uh, pagylated interferon alpha and ribavirin. This is the standard treatment we use for hepatitis C. If you don't mind taking a look at the left upper panel here, this is my son's data. On the x -axis, on the y axis, is the titers of his antibody. My son had Coxsackie B3 and Coxsackie B4. At the time before we started the treatment, it was 640. This is the months. When I started him on ribavirin first, there's a dramatic drop in the titers, down to 80. And he was treated for four months, the titers stay down here. After he's finished treatment, almost within a month or two, his symptoms relapsed and the titer went up to about 320, right here. This is also, we started doing the collaborative work with UCLA, and we found the viral RNA in his blood twice in a two-week interval. So we know there was a presence of virus here. Then I treated my son with interferon and ribavirin here. You can see a significant drop of the, of the titers of Coxsackie B3 virus. And patient, my son felt much better. Then. When we did all the RNA tests here, they were negative. Then we went to Hawaii. He felt so good, he wanted to climb the Diamond Head Volcano. Okay, so we did. Afterwards, he had a relapse. The antibody level went up, viral RNA showed up, and the, basically the antibody stayed at 320 for almost the next four or five years. And then the RNA disappears. As you can see, this pattern repeats in other patients. Okay, this is not just one patient but all the other patients sort of follow this pattern. The next one that we realize is that interferon ribavirin is not powerful enough. But then the combination of the alpha and the gamma interferon has shown great synergistic effect 
in the tissue cultures against enteroviruses. So we decided to treat patients with a combination of alpha and gamma interferon. This is one patient that we actually use Dr. Lerner's energy index here. But we, we give it a, a, a total score over two weeks. So the maximum score, if you can see here, should be about 140. She's never reached that high. But her starting point is about 20 to 30. That's pretty low, isn't it? Out of a possible 140, all right? Before we treated her, we find the viral RNA in her blood in a different laboratory, confirmed by sequencing. And we found her viral RNA in our laboratory, confirmed by sequencing. So there's no doubt she has this, okay? We treated her from interferon here. This is a pretty rough treatment to go through for a patient with chronic fatigue syndrome. So her energy levels drop even more. She was practically all bedridden. Her sister had to come in to help her, okay? A month after her interferon treatment, her energy level went up to the 70, 80 range. She went back to work full time, 40 hours a week. She was getting out at seven o'clock in the morning and went to bed at 11 o'clock at night, doing things for her children. About six months later, she went to Hawaii. Hawaii must have something bad about it, right? <laughs> we should have her come to Britain next time, okay? All right? Well, she had a great time in, in Hawaii. She swam in the ocean with her kids. She climbed the Diamond Head Volcano, et cetera, et cetera. And then she had a relapse. Her energy level dropped, and then her viral RNA showed up. Two positive tests in a two-week period. So we know this is real. This is not false positive. After she rested about a couple of months, the energy level shot up. Then you can see the viral RNA turned negative. She actually added another 20 hours of work. So at this point, she was working 60 hours a week, okay? Staying out from 7 till 11. But one thing she always told me, Dr. Chia, I still feel tired, but I'm functional. But I'm still tired, okay? About 15 months later, right about here, she relapsed. And this is interesting, to put in perspective of what Dr. Lerner just said. Actually, the interesting thing about this is that the, the insurance company called me and said, does she need to keep taking Valtrex? She's been taking Valtrex for almost five years. She, this, is, this is about three years into the Valtrex. And uh, I said, well, I don't know if epstein Barr virus is that important to her. So why don't we just stop? Well, within two weeks, she relapsed. Whether that has anything to do with it, I don't know, but it's certainly interesting, isn't it? That deserves more investigation. So at this point, I actually had to treat her with additional interferon, and she went back to work again. This is a summary of uh, the, uh, the treatment with alpha and gamma interferon. I mean, th this treatment is so expensive. It's $5,000 a month. Um, in, and so we couldn't treat the patient for very long. So basically, we devised the cheapest regimen possible. So we either gave the patient a month of the full dose, or we gave that patient half dose for two to three months. Roughly about, um, i trying to remember here, 50% of the patients that were treated with this interferon regimen significantly improved after completing the treatments, whereas three out of 45 controls that were observed had spontaneous improvement. This was statistically significant. Eight out of the 11 patients treated with a full dose improved whereas seven out of the 19 treated with a half dose improved. This was a little bit better than the half dose. And 10 out of 15 responders returned to full-time work from almost a bedridden state or energy index of Dr. Lerner described, maybe no more than two to three. Today, we gave this treatment to 62 patients and about 47% have responded to combination therapy. This is a Kaplan-Meier uh, plot. Basically, the patients who have improved, I said 100%, and watch them over time. On the average, as you can see, about nine to 12 months is about the medium time the patient will relapse. But some of the patients lasted more than two years. These patients, interesting enough, are the one with a severe myalgia. And just like Dr. Kerr pointed out, there are different subsets of these patients. Some respond better than others. The patient with a debilitating, horrible myalgia responded to this the best. And usually by two weeks of treatment, the pain is completely gone. And those patients, we know will respond. The patients that don't re respond within two weeks, we can't tell. We have to wait until they stop. This leads us to the stomach biopsy because we realize the blood test itself is not good enough to diagnose this, this disease. Then also put into a perspective, I, I need to move on fairly quickly, I realize. 
Um, HIV infections, as you know, patients can have millions and millions of viruses in their, in their blood. So are hepatitis B and hepatitis C patients. But guess what? They don't feel tired. So in this disease, we don't see all this virus, but the patients are tired, right? They have all these weird tissue symptoms. So we said the, t the virus must be in the tissue rather than just running through in the blood, like the HIV. We can use HIV model to study this illness. So then we said, what would be a tissue that's accessible, okay? And we can easily find you know, specimens to look at. The stomach basically turned out to be the tissue. Think about this, respiratory infections. You still have to swallow the secretion into the stomach. With gastrointestinal infection, if you eat something dirty, the food or water, you basically will get the water in, I mean, into the stomach first. So in, by, when the GI doctor look at the stomach, very calmly they will see these little red patches uh, in the, the bottom of the stomach called the entrum. Rarely, you can see some really inflamed uh, entrum right next to the, the, hole, the hole that will go into the duodenum. This is how we saw the staining. These are antivirus stainings. The normal is the blue, like this. So we use an anti-CMV antibody as a control, so this did not stain at all. And in fact, out of 265 specimens, we have not seen a single patient that uh, have CMV staining. Here you can see an extensive staining, which are brown spots, into the, the bi in the biopsy. This is indicative, this is indicative of extensive viral protein in the cells. This we call a two plus. That's important to remember. In this here, you don't see as much staining as this one here, right? This is what we call one plus, less than 50% staining. And then we, re we magnified this specimen to this by four times. You can see the staining is in these parietal cells. This is another four patient example. You can see this extensive staining here in the stomach biopsy. Also this one, much less here. This is a one plus. And this one is completely negative. Some patients do stain negative. And the other thing that we did is since patients have had com chronic complaints, they have had biopsies at different times. Some patients, when they first got ill in 19, one patient got, was first ill in 1999, we can see the staining in the entrum. And then four years later, when she had a repeat endoscopy, we can still see the staining. On the other side, we use CMV as a control. We don't see any staining. So to summarize this data, which has already been published in the pre prestigious journal of clinical pathology, that 82% of the biopsy, this were 165 patients staying positive for this VP1 within parietal cells, whereas only 20% of the controls staying positive. 18 specimens containing three or more sp uh, pieces of the tissues demonstrate a variable staining. That means some pieces are positive, others are not. That means this test is prone to sampling error. So you can't just do one piece of biopsy. You do a biopsy, the endoscopists have to do at least two, three biopsies in order to see the viral protein. We detected the enterovirus RNA in 37% of 24 biopsy samples, and only in one out of three patients, I'm sorry, one out of three patients had detectable enterovirus RNA from two samples taken four years apart. That's the slide I just showed you. One out of 21 controls were positive. This was, again, statistically significant. Of the patients, um, 20, we then try to co uh, correlate the staining with the disability, the functional capability. Of the patients, 89 uh, patients uh, that had two plus staining, only 15 of those patients, or 27% of the patients, were able to perform a six to eight hour per day of sedentary work. Whereas 33 out of 71, uh, or 54% of the patient with no staining or one plus staining could do the same. This was also statistically significant. What that means is that the more viral protein you have, the more dysfunctional you are, the, sim the symptom, more symptomatic you are. To date, we have done 263 samples. Some of the samples came from Canada and other parts of the United States, so not exclusively in Southern California. And it's still 82% positive with 100 more samples. We also added more controls, so 56 uh, controls, 20% were positive. But if we figure, we keep looking at the staining as to how do we make this test more specific. So if we use two plus staining as the positive test, then 57% of the CFS ME patients will be positive, and only 5% of the controls were positive. Then the specificity increased to 95%. That means when it's positive at two plus, there is 
only 5% chance you could be wrong. I better move ahead with this. This, I think, clinched the, the mechanism how these virus survives. What we did here is to analyze the viral, um, uh, did a viral analysis of these stomach samples. We have the VP1 staining. We had, we done RNA sample, uh, testing on the, on the stomach sample. Then I also we put the, the biopsy tissue into culture, okay? I'll just show you here. These are the normal cells that we grow in the tissue culture. When we put the stomach tissues in, after four to six, four to six weeks, we see absolutely no growth, nothing, okay? Then we figured out, if these viruses are defective, maybe we should inhibit the immune system of a cell. A cell has an immune, immune response, which is interferon. So we blocked it with the 5-IDU and also dexamethasone, steroids. Then we put the specimen in, and about four to six weeks, you can see the positives. We, we started growing out the virus. But it's interesting that there was no cell death. None of the cells died, at least by our examination. When we took the specimen and passed it into another culture, it also grew in four weeks. These uh, ones started in white have been sequenced when we published the paper. Actually, subsequently, we grew out many more, probably another seven or eight viruses out of seven or eight samples, and we sequenced them. They're all antiviruses. They're not identical sequences, so they're not contamination. I just want to see, show you briefly that these viral protein can be found elsewhere, too. This is a patient with chronic fatigue syndrome for more than 15 years. She also has a diagnosis of Hashimoto thyroiditis. She has chronic throat pain, and she was so tired, sick and tired of it, she asked the urinal and throat doctor to take five biopsies, okay? Well, this is in the posterior lingual tonsil. You can see the staining of our protein in the macrophages. Macrophages are these white blood cells that catches these viruses. If there's not a Th1 response and the macrophage is not instructed to kill the virus, then they survive in there. This is a, another specimen of that five which does not show any virus protein. So we are lucky to find one out of five specimens. Then five years later, she developed thyroid cancer. As you know, that thyroid cancer is about 6,000 times more prevalent in chronic fatigue patients as compared to normal. Dr. By uh, Byron High's data. So when she had her thyroid taken out, we said, why don't we stain it to see if we can find this, okay? Right next to this area is cancer. This is the inflammation, the inflammatory cells that we can see. That makes it Hashimoto thyroiditis. You can see the viral protein all in the glandular tissue and the glands here. This is a control uh, a slide using herpes 6 staining, and we do not see any staining here. This is a patient that had her, his adenoid removed because of recurrent sore throats. But she, he also had all the other symptoms of chronic fatigue syndrome. Eventually, I met him about three, four years later. So he told me that one of the problems he had is after the adenoid was taken out, this would keep growing back. And the ear, nose, and throat doctor keep worrying about this turning to a lymphoma. So I took one of the specimens and I stained it. This is 100x magnification. You can see some brown spots here. And the 400x, you can see the brown spots in the crypt epithelium. The crypt epithelium is basically the stem cells of the tonsils. They make the tonsils. So these are infected. When we stain it with CMV and a blend of HHV6 antibody provided by the Herpes 6 uh, Foundation, we do not see any staining. What goes on in the cell? This is a hypothesis. Actually, other people have you know, postulated, even before me, that we think there's a persistence of double-stranded RNA. This is almost indestructible, okay? This will separate out into a positive and a minus strand. The plus strand can be made into viral protein, as I have demonstrated in the stomach biopsies. Part of it does go into what I call a non-cytopathic virions or viruses, okay? But from the double-strand RNA and the viral protein, it can stimulate the immune response to make either neutralizing antibodies, interferons, as you can see here, then this will go through the interferon pathway to increase the RNA's L level, which has been well documented in CFS and in patients. Well, the purpose of this is to break down the viral RNA. That's what it is for. When you're trying to break it down, if enough are left over and then reform the double-stranded RNA, this is in the state of viral persistence, 
then the cycles repeats itself. This is almost like weeds, garden weeds and the seeds. Have anybody got rid of weeds yet? So to follow on this, this is a paradigm that proposed by Dr. Paul Levine um, from George Washington University, NCI, published in the, in the American Journal of Medicine in September 1998. He thought that there probably is a genetic predisposition. Then following a triggering agent, either chemicals or infectious agents, this will lead to an immune disequilibrium. This will then lead to chronic immune reactivation and secondary viral infections. In my opinion, that there is a smolder infection. And the number of viruses or infectious agents can survive in the body, and it will trigger this whole immune response leading to the symptoms. And lastly, and not to the least, I have to acknowledge all the investigators who have worked in on antivirus infections in CFS ME, the British investigators in particular, and also the, the physicians and the researchers that worked on animal models. I have to thank my son, Andrew Chia, because he was a victim of this illness. He's here. And his illness inspired this research. But without his technical help for the last seven, eight years, I, we could not have done this. Andrew is going to medical school in August. And I hope one day he will help us with this illness. I have to thank my wife. Thank you. I have to thank my wife for her staff as support in this research. You know how couples go out for a candlelight dinner? <laughs> we went to the lab. Mm -hmm. Very exciting, isn't it? Okay. I have to thank Jiang Tu, the president of Kingston Technology, who has given us generous support to do this work. Without that, this work was not possible. Gilead Science has supported some of the stomach work and all the gastroenterologists who perform the endoscopy and biopsy some patients and all the patients who had confidence in us to do this research. It's given us the tissues, the blood. Thank you.